Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to be here. I'm practicing with the Madonna headset. Um, we'll see how we get on. There will not be any Madonna dancing, I can uh, assure you. But uh, I'm not used to it, so we'll see how we get, get on. Um, this morning, then, we'll uh, do our usual that we've got so used to and run mostly through uh, without many interruptions. Uh, it's good to see you all here. It's still a little bit of the summer holiday, various people off. Um, Brian and Alison sunning themselves somewhere, can't quite remember where. Um, a bit like my dad, go somewhere hot and then complain about the heat. But hey. um, and uh, we've, we've got Jeanette back with us, which is great to see. So welcome everybody who's come back. Uh, usual notices really. Thank you very much, Helen, for getting them together. Uh, next week we have Graham Almonds uh, from Grace with us, and then uh, the week afterwards, uh, and Graham's taking a topic from 2 Samuel 8, Jesus the King, which actually ties in very well with the theme that we've been uh, working on uh, as we go through the Bible. And then uh, Sunday the 15th, Philip Rowlandson, you may remember him visiting us before, and he'll be speaking on the Proclaimed Kingdom, which is the next in our series. Quite a lot to be praying for. Do look at, uh, Helen puts a lot of effort into this. It helps us keep our uh, church uh, moving. And please do note all the prayer points and uh, use them in your daily prayers. Uh, in particular, pulling out the search for a pastor. Uh, we had a follow-up interview. Uh, I mentioned this uh, to folk who were at the uh, prayer meeting, a uh, follow-up conversation with one candidate just to try and uh, fill in some of the gaps that were in the application, some of the questions that came up during the application, and the uh, search group are going to meet on Zoom on Tuesday evening to discuss that conversation before we decide on any next steps. And the other thing I would call out to be praying for um, is the imminent arrival, is it Thursday? of uh, Elevated Joseph from Malawi. Do pray for them, you can imagine. Uh, by then, no doubt, the weather will have turned even colder and rainy, um, and they'll have a huge culture shock. It's their first time uh, in the UK. I think it's, did JJ go to South Africa for some training or something, or is it their first time out in Malawi? They've never been out. They've never been out of Africa in their, their corner of Southern Africa, so imagine the shock. So do be praying uh, for them and for their long program. And then finally, I've put some notices out on the table again uh, for the Bible training event that's being run by the four counties. And uh, Ruth and I, and Elevate and Joseph are going to go. Um, that probably means there isn't much space left in our car. But do let me know, uh, do pick up the leaflet if you're interested, talk to me if you're interested. Anybody who would like to know a little bit more about how to approach Scripture in a structured way as we look to interpret it and understand it, it's a great piece of work that we're going to be um, uh, finding out about at that event. Okay, notices for this morning. Isn't it wonderful to gather together as a, as a people, as a local fellowship? Uh, as we look to serve the Lord, as we look to know Him better, as we look to reflect Him in our daily lives together. Don't know about you, but if it wasn't for our ability to meet face to face together and encourage each other, my Christian life would be very different. So let's come to the Lord in prayer as we look to open our hearts and our souls to Him. Heavenly Father, we gather together in joyous celebration of your eternal kingship that we have seen reflected all the way from the book of Genesis through to uh, where we've got to in our study of your story, of your interaction with mankind. And we lift our hearts and voices as we rejoice in the truth that Jesus is Jesus, our Savior that he reigns with love and righteousness right now in heaven and in our hearts through the working of his Holy Spirit. And we thank you for the victory over sin and death that means we can come with open hands and open hearts this morning before you. 
And we can have that hope of eternal life through nothing but Jesus Christ. May our worship today be filled with awe at what you have done for us, for gratitude for that, and also with triumph that all is conquered through you as we proclaim your glory and majesty even as we meet here, this small group in one corner of your globe. Guide us with your Holy Spirit and let our hearts be ever lifted in praise this morning and as we go into the week ahead. In the name of Jesus we pray. And then in prayer, and as usual, please keep those prayers short so that lots can join in. We read in Psalms, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength, seek his face always.
Let's continue to pray. Almighty God, whose only Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence, give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you. We come before you seeking renewal in mind, body and spirit. We ask that you fill us with your peace and mercy and help us to let go of any burdens that are weighing us down. May your Holy Spirit wash over us, cleansing our heart and refreshing our souls. We pray for our church family and those in need of your physical support, for Stella, Ruth, Anne, Steve and Maggie. For Irma and Simon and, the, and their elderly parents, for Brian and Judy after her eye treatment, and similarly for Esme. Father, we thank you for answered prayers. We praise you that Tina is fit and well again and able to be back with us. We lift before you Bernard and Alison. We pray that you bless them with a good holiday and a time of refreshing. May you continue to give them strength when they return to care for Addison's mum. We pray for Teresa's brother, Rhinus, in Holland. May you reassure him of your love and presence with him as he moves to a hospice this week and be close to the family during this time. We uplift before you Tim and Nicola as they prepare for moving on in their education and for Eleanor and Caleb starting new schools this week. We continue to pray for Elevate and Joseph for Children for Christ Ministry and their imminent arrival to the UK from Malawi. May all the arrangements go smoothly and may their time here be fruitful. And Holy Father God, we continue to look to you for guidance as we search for a new pastor. Help us to know your will clearly. Guide us to the man you want to lead us. May we not stray to the left or to the right, but to know your clear direction. Speak to us, we pray. Lord, as we think about our wider world, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world, persecuted simply because of their love for you. Draw close to them, strengthen them, and keep them steadfast in their faith. Glorify your name through their witness for you. Dear Father, we lift all these prayers to you and ask that in your mercy you bless all those that we have prayed for this morning. For your glory. Amen.
we have the opportunity to return to this passage and chapter 1, verses 1 to 15. Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As John was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, <coughs> Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Sometimes forget there's a bit of video on a page because it looks black, like just like the black pages. So that's what's happened there. We're not listening to that again. But I hear you had a good time, was it last week, listening to that sermon. So it's good that we have the flexibility um, of being able to look at quality sermons like that. My only plea would be, don't judge your local preachers by the, by the standard of these great guys that are on, are on YouTube. The time has come. Uh, keep the Bibles open in your, ha in your hand, your finger in, uh, in first mark, mark. We'll come to it in a second. But uh, the time has come. I don't know about you, but when my brother and I were little, um, the biggest event in the year was Christmas. I don't know about you, but Christmas was just something special. Presents, of course. And for us, the countdown began really early. In Scotland, we haven't, uh, in my day anyway, we hadn't inherited the American idea of Halloween. It was still the Celtic idea of Halloween, and it was quite big. So countdown to Christmas started at Halloween. And all these days afterwards, it was the countdown and the countdown, and the anticipation of Santa Claus coming was phenomenal. Is it still the same in your household? They're not quite so bad? This one in particular. And you know, when it came to Christmas Day morning, I don't know, we were up at the crack of dawn, bouncing on our mum and dad's beds to try and get all the presents. But it was always, well, for many years, it was an anticlimax for me. 
You see, you may have noticed I have terrible, uh, terrible difficulty remembering names and, and particular terms. And back in those days, it was the same. Through the year, I, we always played soldiers. This was in the 60s, okay? The Second World War wasn't that far away. And cowboys and Indians and Brits and Jerrys was the in thing through the woods close by. And I always wanted a soldier's outfit for Christmas. But I wanted a cavalry soldier's outfit. The problem is, by the time I came to write my letter for Santa, I couldn't remember the word for cavalry. So I said, a soldier's outfit. And every Christmas, I got the wrong soldier's outfit. I was disappointed. What I'd been hoping for didn't satisfy me. The wonderful thing about where we are now in our story is, in God's big picture, is we get to the point of complete fulfillment and satisfaction starting in our world for the first time since Genesis 3. We've been through quite a sequence of events, haven't we, in our Bible studies through, through the Bible from Genesis, the pattern of the kingdom. See if you can remember the basic points as we went through those, the pattern of the kingdom, the perished kingdom, the promised kingdom, the partial kingdom, when uh, Israel entered the promised land, the prophesied kingdom, that despite everything that was going on, there was going to be a better future. And now we have got to the present kingdom, the present kingdom, to which the whole story has been pointing. Do you remember these diagrams that have gone up every now and then? It's a brilliant picture. Uh, to keep in front of your Bible or whatever, or maybe you've got a study, study Bible which shows this in different ways. The Garden of Eden, the fall, the promise to Adam and to Moses, the exodus, the law, the conquest of the promised land, the monarchy coming in. And what do we find with the monarchy? After David, what happens? It's just spiraling down in decline. But then there was the prophetic point forward to the great hope, to the coming of the perfect king. The Bible is um, Bible's very clear about Jesus' fulfillment of this promise. That the whole Bible points forward to this person called Jesus. The Bible has one story about one person, Jesus, God's King. John 5, 39 says, says this, the study the scriptures, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify to me. He was saying to the Jews here, Jesus was saying to the Jews, the whole of the scriptures that you study are pointing to me, just as we have found over these last few weeks. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, for no matter how many promises God has made, I think this is wonderful, all these promises that he has made to all these folk through the, the centuries, they are yes in Christ. They are yes in Christ. And in him, through him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Through Jesus we can say Amen, Amen, Amen. And the coming of Jesus isn't just the fulfillment of human history. We're told in Romans 8 that the whole of creation has been waiting for this time. You remember the disaster in the Garden of Eden wasn't just about humankind, it was about the whole of creation falling. And we're told in Romans 8 that the whole of creation groans in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time when creation as a whole finally meets its king and he starts to rebuild his kingdom. And it's not just about history. Wonderfully, as so many of us know here this morning, it's not just about history, the Bible tells us that you and I can
can meet God's Christ today. And for many of us, we're meeting him here together today as he works through his Holy Spirit in our lives and our times and our places and our relationships as we meet with him daily and he changes our lives forever and for eternity. So this morning we are going to look a little at this present kingdom and what it means that Christ has come as the fulfillment of those promises. As we look at the book of Mark, I love it. It is so pithy and it's present. And the first thing I'd like to pull out in our little passage and use it as, a, uh, as some hooks to hold some principles onto is kingship declared. I love the book of Mark. It's one of them. It's usually the one I would recommend a new Christian to read first or somebody seeking because it's short and it's pithy and it keeps boldly to the, to the clear path of Jesus' life. And there, you notice in verse 1, there is just no preamble. It's straight in. It's straight to it. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. No preamble, straight in between your eyes. I mean, as a Glaswegian, I just love that. It reminds me a little um, of um, when I was playing at being a toy soldier in the territorial army. All the NATO armies have a common way, so that if you're working together, they have a common way of giving their orders. And the first thing an officer does is say, listen up. Orders! Orders! And everybody knows something is important coming. And what John is saying in this passage immediately is, listen up! What Mark is saying in his Bible, in his, his letter, is listen up! Orders! Orders! This is important! This is important! No messing! Listen! This is important! The good news Verse 1 again, the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, has come. You know, in our daily lives, we can so easily forget how fundamental the thing that perhaps if you're like me for 30, 40 plus years you've known in your heart, we can, we can drift and we can forget the, the excitement of that first discovery that Jesus is Lord and has come into this world to live with us. Can you remember the first time you saw your life partner? I didn't plan this, so I'm going to embarrass Ruth. I can remember crystal clear, I was sitting in a minibus. These two young women were late to get to the minibus to go to camp. Uh, and suddenly these two Irish girls appeared on the other side of the street and got into the minibus and I can distinctly remember seeing her. If I can remember that, why do we so often forget the impact of what Mark is pointing out here, the importance of this fact that Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, has come into the world, and it is good news. He's the Son of God, the exact representation of God. That's what it means, doesn't it? He is the Son of God, he's the exact representation of God. I searched yesterday, my Ruth searched yesterday, for this photo for me, for me to illustrate this point. This is the eldest son of the eldest son of the eldest son. It's back in 2003, I think. So almost 20 years ago. So that young guy in the middle is me, just to point it out, 20 years ago. And that's my dad on the right and my eldest son on the left. Now, I don't know about you, but I think there's certain similarities, don't you? If somebody saw me and my dad together, they'd either think we were brothers or dad and son. Son, yeah, because 
I am an image of my father. There's some of my mom in there, but there's more of my mom and my brother than it is of me. I am the image of my father. Now, I'm not the perfect image of my father, but as I get older, my children now tell me, even my mannerisms are getting, Bruce laughing here, even my mannerisms are getting more and more like my dad. Jesus is like that, but perfect. The Bible tells us image-wise, he's like the stamp that was used for the Roman coins with the image of the emperor on it. He is the exact representation, the exact stamp. You use a stamp so it's all exactly the same. He is exact representation of God. And his mannerisms are the exact representation of the heart of God. What he says and does, what we can see and listen, when we see Jesus, we see God. When we listen to Jesus, we are listening to God. When we see his actions through the Gospels or in our lives, we are seeing God. When we know Jesus fully and truly in our lives, we know God. He is the exact image. Colossians 1, 15 puts it this way, and I've used, I've used the Amplified Bible. I'm going to put up the Amplified Bible here. I don't know if any of you ever use it. It's got extra words in it for those of us who aren't Greek experts to try and help us understand the full meaning of the underlying Greek. Look at it here. Bits and square brackets are the extra words. They're not like some Bibles which are interpretations by one individual. These are sometimes weird interpretations. Uh, these are scholars who've unpacked the Greek. He is, this is Jesus, he is the exact living image. In the Greek, that means the essential manifestation. Do you know that word? It's a bit of a long one. But at its core, is manifest, yeah? And a manifest for a boat tells you exactly what's going to go on the boat, yeah? So it's that exact, that exact essential manifestation of the unseen God. So he's the visible representation of the invisible. He's the firstborn, the preeminent one, the sovereign and originator, because in those days, the firstborn, my younger son, my younger brother disagrees with this, of course, but the elder son is the preeminent one, the, the sovereign, the originator, royalty passed down through the firstborn of all creation, not just of mankind, but the creator and sustainer of all creation. He's the son of God. He is the exact image of God, and he comes into the world as fulfillment of all the promises that have gone through the Old Testament. The good news about Jesus the Messiah, the son of God. Secondly, He's the Lord. He's the Son of God, but He's the Lord. Look in verse 3. Oops, going too fast. Look in verse 3. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. We've heard that word again and again in our Bibles as we've gone through. It's, it's God Himself. The word Lord there is the word for the, for the, the King. Usually applied in the Old Testament to God, sometimes in the prophets applied to the fourth, the person who's going to come, but also with that con always with that connotation that it is God Himself. John is like a town crier, crier, saying, "Get out of the way! Here comes the King." You know, even today, have you ever seen a, a royal set of cars coming? When Ruth and I were in Malawi, uh, we, we once had to stop because the president was coming in his car. And the police stopped us and we were waiting and we were waiting and we were waiting because it was so important that the roads were clear for this guy. And then about 15, 20 minutes late, later, finally the apparatus come and they sweep through and then we're allowed to go on our way. 
That's what, Mark, that's what John is saying here in Mark. That's what John is doing here in Mark. He is preparing the way for the king. The king is coming. The time is so very near. The God who spoke through the prophets is now amongst us. And my friends, he's here with us today as well. That is the amazing truth that scripture unfolds and we can hold in our hearts. He's the Lord. He's the Son of God, and He's the Christ. Verse 1 again. He's the Messiah. He's the Anointed One. He's the longed, hoped for One. The One that the whole of the history of mankind has lived up to. He's the One who's going to restore everything to the original perfect state of peace. He's the eternal, pre-incarnate Word of John 1. And so John here in the book of Mark is saying, wake up, wake up, here is your king, the one you've been waiting for. And he's not just a character in a story, he's the writer of the story. And he's come here to fulfill the story. And whether we know it or not, or whether we want to know it or not, he is the central character of our lives. And our response to him determines our eternity. Are we living out our lives as disciples, if we're disciples here this morning, with Christ our King as the center? Kingdom declared, but also kingdom recognized. As John meets, in the passage we've been reading this morning, as John meets his longed for king, he recognizes him truly for who he is. We see this in his humbleness. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie, he says in verse 7. You know, despite this huge fan club that he has got, this man, in such a lovely expression of humility, shows that he understands his position to Jesus. I don't know, maybe deep down he remembers that uh, when he was still unborn that that kink of recognition that we read about in the gospels he obviously knew jesus from a human perspective because he was his cousin but here he recognizes him for the full spiritual person that he is and if anything would that not be more difficult you know if your brothers or sisters or cousins came up to you and said they were something really special probably the last thing you're going to believe but but John recognizes Jesus for who he truly is and his relationship to him not as cousin but as fallen sinner in front of the Messiah <coughs> the King the Son of God and we see this is understood because he he recognizes what Jesus is about in verse 8 I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John recognized his limitations. You know, baptism with water wasn't something special. It was part of the Jewish tradition. It meant I recognize I need to be forgiven. I recognize I need to repent. And I want to start again. But John knew that any bath was just the outside. And what Jesus could do was clean the inside through the work of the Holy Spirit. Our inner life, our hearts can be cleansed personal white. If you're as old as me, that will probably remind you of something. Personal white to our very, very soul. 
That's such an encouragement, isn't it? Not just as seekers we come to Jesus for the first time, but as we struggle day in, day out with the old self and the sin battling with the new self and the spirit in our hearts, that in the end, spirit wins out. And in the end, because of what Christ has done for us, our very souls are seen as washed by God. Properly washed. I'll put this one in as an example. I, I have a problem when I'm washing the dishes. Ruth doesn't let me off with this, but because I'm a bit taller than the average, the problem is sinks are designed for the average height. Any tall guys here have this problem? Tall women, for that matter. And so, to, to get to the dishes, I end up like this, and then I get a really sore back. That's my excuse. It's probably just an excuse, because Ruth, Ruth would say, I don't wash the dishes properly. You see, I, a bit like perhaps John, I, I might dip the water in, and then it's up where it's a nice, comfortable height for me, I'm washing the dishes up here. And time after time, I'm quite rightly told, let them soak and wash them properly, the inside as well, in the sink. And that's the difference between John's baptism and Jesus. John's baptism was symbolic and good, but it was of the outside. Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit is much better than me. It cleans the whole soul. So we've seen kingship recognized. And isn't John's response in the face of the king, such a wonderful heart posture. He had all the things going for him in his chosen, his chosen life. He had hundreds of people flocking to him to see what this weird guy in weird clothing and belts and eating locusts and all that sort of stuff was about. But they were being changed. But he didn't let any of that go to his head. Friends, are there some of us here that are still allowing the world to go through our head? Or even let, and this is probably even bigger a danger, our feeling of self-sufficiency and understanding of what it means to be a Christian to go through our head. And not to continue to humbly recognize that Jesus is the source of our strength and our power and our direction. That that lovely heart posture that we see in John of humbleness and complete surrender has to be ours. And then immediately the Spirit sends John into the desert where for 40 days he's tempted by Satan in verses 12 to 13. And there the kingdom is proven. So there the kingdom is proved. There's many ideas woven into this passage in Jesus' life. It should be, there's some resonances at so many levels if we know the Old Testament. And as we've swept through the Old Testament to today. One is the idea of being tempted by the devil. Where do we remember that from? Interaction here, just testing you away. What was that? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, of course. I'm just testing your life. I'm being a bit African here. Um, the Garden of Eden. And that would have been in foremost in listeners' minds. Again, as so often in Scripture, the prophets did this. God has planned this almost to be like performance art. The actions are part of the story. They're part of the big picture. It's not an audio book. It's a movie that God is creating in his interaction with the world. And here is Jesus being Adam and Eve again. And in a position where he is being tempted by the evil one. The second is the 40 in the story. 40 is a really important number in the Bible, isn't it? It sort of means a long time and a difficult time. Where does 40 come up so far in our story? Wilderness. The wilderness. 40 years in the wilderness. 
And then even in like the story of Moses, his life is in 40s. I won't go through it all, but the three 40s are in his life. But he spent 40 years as a shepherd, probably in the wilderness with his sheep. This, and it's about this, the, the 40 years in the wilderness was the start of the new Israel after the 40 years. And here is Jesus supremely passing the test that Adam and Eve failed. And Jesus supremely showing himself as the true people of God by passing through those 40 days without sin. Jesus is saying, trust in me. I've taken the test and I have passed it. Ruth and I, when we were in Malawi, we had to get a, a Malawi driving license. You can only spend so long on your UK driving license. This is a picture of the main road that wasn't far from our house uh, in Lantyre. It actually makes me a little homesick when I see photos like this, because Malawi is one of my homes. Um, and that was pretty typical. Um, in a very Malawi way, they built this really impressive pedestrian flyover, which nobody used because they left uh, a zebra crossing there and everyone just used the zebra crossing so the cars were all held up anyway. And I was one of them as well because we couldn't be bothered opening up there. But we had to do the test and the test had just been changed so that you had to do a, you had to do a theory test as well as a, a practical test. And because we had a license, it was only the theory test we had to do. And boy, that was difficult. We didn't even really know much about it. We turned up at this little test center uh, and suddenly we were told we were going to do this test and we were given this tatty little book with coffee stains on it and everything and we quickly read up. And it was very, very difficult in a way, even as English speakers, uh, native English speakers, because it was really complex, double negatives throughout all the tests and all the rest of it. But we passed. We passed. And we'd also passed our way, way, way back, we'd passed our driving line test in, in the UK, a very strict one, yes? I almost failed because uh, a child was playing with a stone in the, ro in the road uh, and, as, and as I went forward towards it, the first thing I wanted to do was peep my horn as I would be taught, but unfortunately I was in a, a, in a different car and when I went to peep the horn I washed my windscreen. <laughs> I knew I had passed when at the end, when we were doing, in those days you didn't do a theory test, you did a few questions at the end of the practical test. And I knew I had passed when the instructor said, or the, the examiner said, Miles, uh, when you are coming up to a, to a child in the road, do you, do you uh, use your audible warning device or do you wash your windows? <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd passed because he would have joke. Many people in Malawi get somebody to do the test for them. It is so easy to pass a few bucks to somebody who will go and do the test for you. That's not right. And the consequences on the Malawi roads are quite serious. But we have somebody who has taken the test and passed it for us. It's as blunt and simple and weird and revolutionary and shocking as that. All these Jews who've been trying so hard and so faithfully through their religion to be right with God were being told that they had failed. But Jesus had succeeded. And we could become, through him, people of God. He is the vine. And we are the branches. Through who he is, we can become the people of God. So kingship proved Jesus showing that he is God's people in a special way and we can become God's people through him. He's showing us, do you remember that little, um, the little three points about what the kingdom is? People, place, rule and blessing. It's a combined third one. Kingdom, place, rule and blessing. Jesus is showing that he is the 
representation of God's people and through him we can become God's people. He's showing that he elsewhere in scripture, he shows that he is the true tabernacle, the true place. John 1 14 shows him as the true tabernacle. John 7 shows him as the true temple. So he is the symbolism of the place in which and through which we can be in God's place. And he also shows, and we've seen it already in his kingship, that he is the true king, the son of God, the miracles that he performed, uh, the conquest over Satan, that he is the true king. And he is the foretaste in his life on earth of the ultimate blessings that are to come. That we have life after death we have eternal rest, eternal Shabbat, the eternal time of peace and rest with God to come. And finally, in our passage, we see the aspect of this fulfillment in the King's call. The King's call. And Mark shows that not only not only John can be straight in between your eyes, but so can Jesus. So can Jesus. Jesus, after John was put in prison, verse 14, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he says. The kingdom of God is near. Here's some cuddly 10 points on how to live your life. Come and be warm and cuddle. Is that what he says? No. He says, repent and believe the good news. At its core, the only valid response to this good news declared by John in the life of Jesus in all that Jesus did in this passage and through his time on earth is to repent. John saw that and that drove his humble posture. The time has come. The kingdom is near. Now in one sense, the kingdom of God was near then because Jesus was just about to start his public ministry and to display himself for who he is. In another way, it's near because the cross is coming. The ultimate demonstration of the humbleness of God the Son. And it's also a reflection forward to us in our lives here. The kingdom is near in our lives. In, the, in one way, and this is a very Celtic way, it's a, very, an emphasis in the Celtic Christianity. Because... God is as near, God is so near, God is like just a heartbeat away, God is with us, just because we cannot see him, doesn't stop us sensing him. I think we must all have had those times when it felt that God was breaking into our lives. It happens in so many different ways and so many different times. It can be a passage of scripture we're reading that just breaks in in a new way. It can be a time of prayer when we suddenly feel the Holy Spirit driving us in a direction. It can be looking up at a dark sky as you wash the dishes, as happened to me as a teenager in Glasgow, and seeing the stars cast above Glasgow. We can be that close, we are that close to God's kingdom now. And of course, God could come again. Jesus could come again at any time. So there's an urgency in what John was saying. And there's an urgency in what Jesus is saying to us now. Get real. Wake up. Listen. The time is coming when every one of us will stand before Jesus, before the throne of God, asked, on what basis do you stand in front of me? 
And if her answer is about anything other than, I stand here washed by the blood of Jesus. I'm standing with a clean heart through his baptism of the Holy Spirit. Our life will be very different from the promise that God gives us here of a time of eternal Sabbath Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace and grace. And then we will see Jesus there as the King. And we will be finally, truly, God's people gathered across all nations in front of the throne. And we will see that blessing and that ruling in action forevermore. So we've seen this wonderful, wonderful climax of the story so far. The cross of Christ. Christ entering the world. It wasn't like my Christmases when it finally came and it was disappointment. I never got, by the way, the cavalry suit. By the time I remembered the word, I was too old to want to soldier and other things. I got lots of others. But it's not going to be disappointment like my Christmas is. It's going to be absolute, perfect fulfillment. The anointed one, the eternal pre-incarnate word of God, Jesus the Savior is going to come. The composer is going to be not only the conductor of our lives, but the composer of our lives. Not just a character in the play, but the composer of the play will be before us. If there's anyone here who doesn't know the delight of that true indwelling spirit and that true relationship with Jesus, then repent and believe is the message this morning. And do it with a sense of urgency. Cling to that wonderful Jesus we see as the perfect reflection of God. And as believers here this morning, let's remember again our first love and our first sight of the first love and that closeness to Jesus that we had when we first knew him. You know, I have the privilege of seeing children, especially in my SU days, that first moment when they get it. And it's, it's like a light goes out on behind their eyes. Do you remember that in you, in your heart? A change so bright that people around you saw it shining through your eyes. Let's be like that again. As we seek to live out and for people to see that light shining in us in the week ahead. Amen. 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 Good. You'll be good African. Let's pray. No, I wanted to close with some words from Timothy Keller. You heard of that guy? Great preacher in America. He summed up in, a, in one paragraph, probably better than anything I've said this morning, the, the sort of theme. This is what he said, more or less. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story and every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. Jesus is a true and better Adam who obeyed God in the garden. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered God's call to leave a comfortable and the comfortable and familiar to go out and create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Moses who leads his people out of their slavery, not to Egypt, but out of sin. Jesus is the true and better Passover lamb slain so the angel of death would pass over us. Jesus is the true and better Israel, who passed the test in the wilderness. Jesus is the true and better David, who slays the strong man to win victory for his people.
Jesus is a true temple. He's a true prophet. He's a true priest. He's a true king. He's a true sacrifice. He, bring, he comes to bring us the very goal of creation. Come to me, all you, you, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The kingdom of God has come. There is only one response possible. Repent and believe the good news. Let's pause and reflect ourselves for a few minutes before I pray. Our living and loving Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you that you came to this earth, that such was your love for humanity and for each one of us, that you were willing to take on flesh, that you were willing to be abused, to be spat on, to be beaten, to be whipped, to be crucified. Such is your love for us. May we never lose the wonder of the cross, of God becoming flesh, of Christ, the perfect reflection of God, coming into space and time, crucified, risen, and ascended, the great yes to all the promises of God, that we might have life in all its fullness and peace.
tea, coffee, chat, a catch up, a discussion of what you've been thinking as you've uh, listened to God's word this morning. Um, if those who are clearing away can maybe stay behind and meet with me as well. Um, we may have to change our storage plans a little now that school is back this week. Um, we'll discuss that. Okay, let's pray again. Lord, we thank you for those lovely words of that song. And we pray that they won't have just been words from our lips, but words from our heart. We thank you that you led us to the cross where we saw your love displayed. We thank you that you touched our hearts first, that allowed us to come out of our sin to you. And we pray that you will use our ransomed life in any way that you choose, that we might humbly lay our lives like John did at your feet and allow you to use them and to direct them. We know that we won't be able to do that on our own. And so we pray these things to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or can even imagine according to your power that is at work within us. To you be glory in this church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations to come, forever and ever. Amen.